Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, dry Brisbane. We can't guarantee it'll be dry in an hour, but we'll do our best. Um, it gives me a great uh, privilege to uh, welcome Dr. Mark Levy uh, uh, and Mark's members of Mark's extended family who have joined it. Mark flew in uh, last week, and uh, we're delighted to be able to have an eminent speaker of Mark's calibre amongst us. About 18 months ago, uh, Asthma Australia was made aware through our colleagues in the Asthma UK organisation that a new report was going to be produced, and that report uh, quite unsubtly is titled uh, Deaths in Asthma. And uh, when we spoke to Mark about coming out, we were immediately struck uh, about the comparisons to our own situation in this country. So very quickly, uh, Mark is a very proud general practitioner. Uh, he works in London and has been there since 1977. Uh, coincidentally, I understand today is uh, National Star Wars Day, and uh, that was the year that Star Wars was released. Uh, Mark, is, uh, Mark is not keen for me to talk about his uh, respiratory and medicine uh, background, but rather the fact that he is a very keen wildlife photographer. Uh, and. Uh, Last night, whilst we were enjoying dinner, the stories, uh, me sharing crocodile and shark stories, paled into, into, into insignificance as he shared a charging rhino elephant uh, running at his camera. Um, I understand, though, he didn't tell me I had a long lens on it and the thing was about a kilometre away. But, uh, um, so we've suitably impressed Mark with stories of sharks and uh, the fact that uh, lots of us, more Australians die from sharks than they do from asthma, potentially. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, um, we'd like to talk a little bit about the, the NRAD report. So the National Review of Asthma Deaths 2011-2014 was commissioned by the UK Department of Health. All deaths were reviewed in a coronial situation and case by case unpacked to determine the cause of death and how those deaths could have been preventable in using the system. Mark's experience and lengthy support of Asthma UK is absolutely acknowledged, but his many, many years of patient care and support are a wonderful testimony to a general practitioner who is passionate about not just adopting a patient-centred approach, but actually adopting a system-wide practice. And that's why we were so keen to have Mark talk to us today, given our themes about connecting asthma care. So without further ado, uh, Peter and I will get off the stage and we'd like to welcome our good friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Levy. Thank you, Mark and Peter, and uh, I'd like to thank the organization for inviting me here today. It is indeed a great pleasure, and I'm glad to say that I've almost overcome the jet lag. Um, so, um, good. As uh, Mark said, I, I do a bit of wildlife photography, so you might see the odd picture cropping up. Um, I'm going to be talking about the National Review of Asthma Deaths, and while I'm delighted to be here, I'm also very sad to be talking about this topic because um, I've been involved in asthma care for many years and trying to improve asthma care for many years. And doing this study was really quite a, a sad shock and a wake-up call to discover that we haven't really advanced in 50 years. So I'm going to, that was just to remind you that I'm, my funny accent is from South Africa, actually. I'm not, I'm not a, a London-born individual. So um, I'm going to, this is my lecture plan. I'll talk a bit about the history of asthma care, quick uh, uh, tour through that, and then focus in on the, on the National Review of Asthma Deaths. Talk about the aims and objectives, how we did it, and what we found, and the lessons that we learned. Now this report is available in full on the Royal College of Physicians website. So. I would encourage you to read the, at least read the executive summary, which summarizes the um, 17 findings and the 19 recommendations that we made as a result of this report. Now, that's not an Australian beer mug. It's actually the first inhaler that was invented in 1778 by a guy called John Mudge. And now in the early part of the last century, the main treatment of asthma was by uh, adrenaline via a vaporizer pump, very much like an early nebulizer. And in the 50s, there was a young girl who was really upset about having to use this medication. And she managed to persuade her father 
um, who um, was uh, George Mason, was working for Riker Laboratories in the 50s. And he's the guy that invented the PMDI, pressurized meter dose inhaler that we all know so well, for his daughter and helped her manage her asthma. Now, quick uh, run through the history of asthma. Um, actually, we've got information from the Ebers Papyrus, 1500 BC, which indicated that people were using a herb called henbane, which they dissolved in water and put on hot bricks and then used it as an inhalation for symptoms which are described very similar to asthma today. And as we progress through, through the years, in the, um, sorry, this screen is flashing like anything as it's supposed to be. Um, as we progress through the years, in the um, early 70s, um, we had new drugs developed, salbutamol, beclomethasone, and Intel, I don't know if any of you remember Intel, sodium chromoglycate, which used to be the mainstay for treating asthma in, in the late 70s. And then late 80s, a couple of things happened. One of which was a publication by Christine Bucknell, a, uh, she was a GP then, uh, later became a physician, on patients who were discharged from hospital, this was 1988, discharged from hospital after being treated for acute asthma on exactly the same treatment that they came in on. So asthma in the 80s was not being treated as if it was a chronic disease. People were taken into hospital, given high-dose bronchodilators, and sent straight out again on exactly the same medication. And you'll see that becomes a theme in the cases that I'm going to talk about and the problems with management of asthma today. Um, then came the great debate from New Zealand um, on uh, phenot uh, uh, phenotrol, which was a bronchodilator, which was associated with asthma deaths, because there were a large number of asthma deaths in New Zealand in the late 80s. And Richard Beasley, in 1989, published the paper describing asthma self-management plans. So the birth of self-management plans actually comes from this part of the world. And as you know, we base our treatment very much on patient education and the use of self-management plans. And that started here. Now, asthma guidelines were developed in the early 90s. Um, the British guidelines were published in 1990, and then followed by the GINA guidelines, which became the international gold standard for management of asthma in 95. And we had lots of research, um, mainly from pharma companies, demonstrating how well drugs work and the various devices work in asthma treatment. But sadly, what's happened recently is we've seen a number of papers which have illustrated very clearly that asthma guidelines are not being implemented. So we've got these wonderful guidelines and nobody's actually using them. And I think that's a fundamental problem. It's all very well to produce guidelines, but if we don't implement a, a system for making them work and putting them into practice when they develop, then they're not going to help anybody. Um, Is there any way to stop the screens from flashing? So what I'm going to be talking about, really, is a failure to implement guidelines. And um, you'll see from the data that I'm presenting, this is, is a big problem. So we look at the definition of asthma, and this comes from your own Australian guidelines, which I, I think are really very good. Um, of course, they, they're linked very strongly to the GINA guidelines because I know Helen Riddell um, was involved in their development and Helen is our uh, chair of our scientific group on GINA. But I'd like to point out that asthma is defined as a chronic disease characterized by fluctuation or variation in lung function and in symptoms. And that's how we should be managing this condition, not as if it's a chronic, uh, and not as if it's a series of acute illnesses. So we'll start with some data on childhood asthma deaths, um, some of which was published in Australia and New Zealand um, a number of years ago. And the pattern um, that was discovered or uh, uh, identified in these studies um, includes a high proportion of patients who were treated as if they had mild asthma. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, a number of patients who uh, 
the screen is just not working. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> trying to follow here and I can't see up there. So uh, a number of patients had uh, been identified as having uh, admissions to hospital and particularly admission to intensive care. The East of England Confidential Inquiry, which is an ongoing study looking at asthma deaths in, in the UK, um, has identified that uh, in 20 children who died from asthma, half of them had been in hospital with severe attacks in the year before they died. And a, a large proportion of these were not managed by specialists. Um, asthma action plans were not implemented, and this refers to a study published only um, eight, nine years ago. And therapy before people died was inadequate. Now, you'll know that long-acting beta agonists should not be used without inhaled steroids, and 30% of patients in the East of England study were prescribed long-acting beta agonists without any inhaled steroids, which is a potentially lethal prescription because somebody's just getting a reliever and they're not getting any preventer medication. Peak flow measurement and uh, measurement of spirometry is not done um, often enough in people with asthma, in particular people who've died from asthma. Now, if you look at the asthma death studies, and I've summarized some of them, you'll see a high proportion of um, patients who've died from asthma who've had preventable factors, major preventable factors identified. Um, most of the studies indicate over 70% have preventable factors. And the key message there is that asthma deaths are essentially preventable. And we've got nice examples from other countries. You're going to hear about Finland, for example, and Brazil, where they've managed to reduce preventable asthma deaths. Now, this is some data just demonstrating the variation in care of people with asthma in the UK and in Europe. The top graph, both of those graphs come from the European Respiratory Society's white book. And the top graph shows as, uh, hospital admissions and the bottom one, mortality. And you can see the dark colors are high uh, admissions and high mortality rates. And you can see the wide variation despite us having um, good quality medication, good quality drugs, and guidelines which uh, are evidence-based. Now, the Australian asthma death uh, prevalence um, is uh, in the higher, uh, compared to the European death rates, is amongst the higher death rates in, in Europe. And this is a map which we call the map of medicine in the UK. And it's used to compare care, in this case, hospital admissions for asthma. And again, you can see the wide variety um, in the number of admissions um, across uh, uh, London in the graph on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and there's no logical explanation for this. We all should be managing this condition consistently. And you might say, do we need more specialists? And sadly, this is one of the conclusions that I've come to at the end of this National Review of Asthma Deaths. Having fought for years to get asthma management into primary care, I think we need to think more carefully about that and get more specialist involvement. Now, that doesn't mean hospital specialists. It means more highly trained GPs and, and nurses. And if we go back a 1,000 years, this is what Moses Maimonides said. You know, he said people with asthma should actually be um, treated by people with expertise. You may not know, but he was the physician to um, Saladin, whose son had really severe asthma. And one of his favorite treatments was uh, chicken soup with drops of owl's blood in it. Apparently, that worked for asthma a 1,000 years ago. Now, the immediate background history for the NRAD started with asthma death studies in the 60s in the UK. Um, that was followed in 83 by the British Thoracic Society's publication, seminal publication on 90 deaths, which showed us very clearly that people with asthma and health professionals were not recognizing the risks and were not managing the condition appropriately. In 1987, we had two organizations, um, the Asthma Society, and the Friends of the Asthma Research Council. And they merged in 1987 to form the National Asthma Campaign and now known as Asthma UK. And while this was fantastic on a corporate level, we, we got um, a lot of funding for research, 
and um, you know, uh, uh, the op opportunity to lobby with governments, we lost our local group activities, which I think is one of the sad things that happened as a result of our merger. And I would urge you, I know you're thinking about merging your organizations, I'd urge you to retain the local activity because I think that's where people learn the most. Now the GP and asthma group was formed late 80s and the asthma training center, which was set up for training nurses with asthma, um, was also around about the 80, uh, 87. That was Greta Barnes and now Monica Fletcher. So our first guidelines were published in, um, in 1990. And the GPIG did a study three years later and found that those guidelines were not being implemented. And sadly, it's the same today. So the East of England confidential inquiry is ongoing. And all of these asthma death studies keep coming up with the same messages. We're not managing asthma. We're not identifying risk. We're not um, providing patients with self-management plans. And we're not using enough uh, objective measurements. And as a result of this, the UK government, so that's England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, all four governments came together and decided to commission this uh, review on asthma deaths. And when I was interviewed, I was asked whether we would find anything different. And to be honest, I said, no, I don't think so. But this would be a hell of a good opportunity to make a lot of noise about asthma management, which had really gone right off the radar. And essentially, that's what's happened. Um, not that anything has been done. And it's wonderful to hear your politicians are thinking about asthma, but in the UK, they're not doing anything really for asthma. I know we've got an election going on at the moment, but we've not seen any positive action yet. So I live in hope. Um, so this was commissioned by the Department of Health and run by the Royal College of Physicians. And you'll see the aim of this study was not to lay any blame. It was not to estimate the prevalence of asthma deaths, because that's another task for another day, and I'll explain why. Um, but we wanted to look in depth at asthma deaths and the circumstances surrounding people's deaths, and try and learn lessons and make recommendations for improving asthma care. So I'm going to start with a case review, just to illustrate the sort of problems that we identified. And um, while this review relates to nurse management, I should say that um, a lot of nurses in the UK are delegated to do asthma reviews without any training in asthma. And I think this case illustrates this very strongly. So we've got a female with late onset asthma. And when she saw her GP, she said that she'd been using her mother's inhaler and it was working and it was giving her relief. She's wheezing, she's coughing. And instead of prescribing something for her, the doctor ordered spirometry, ordered lung functions to be done in the practice. And it took, for some reason, it took nine months for those lung functions to be done. And when they were done, this woman clearly had asthma. She had high variability of uh, uh, variable airflow obstruction. And the doctor prescribed beclomethasone for her, a low dose inhaled steroid. Now, what happened later was that she didn't attend frequently for her asthma reviews. And when she did attend for a review with the nurse, we've got a system in the UK where GPs are paid for doing asthma reviews. I mean, it's not only asthma. We, a lot of our clinical work is paid for on, on an item of service basis. And so we've got some tick boxes on the computer screens. And the boxes were all ticked in this case. The patient's waking at night. She's waking, having symptoms in the day. Asthma is limiting her lifestyle. And in the past 12 months, she was using excess uh, bronchodilators. Now, you'll be aware from your own guidelines that anybody using two to four puffs of uh, salbutamol a week is deemed to have poorly controlled asthma. Now, there's 200 puffs of salbutamol in an inhaler. So it doesn't take a math genius to work out that you, anybody using more than three inhalers in a year has probably got poor asthma control. So if you allow a couple more, one for the car and one for the briefcase, six inhalers a year of bronchodilator should be the maximum that anybody's prescribed without the doctor or nurse getting that patient in and finding out what's going wrong. So this 
woman had 16 salbutamols in the previous 12 months, the one beclomethasone, and the nurse advised her to make an appointment with the doctor. Now, those of you with experience in asthma will know that that nurse should have banged on the GP's door and said, see this woman now. She wasn't seen, and she died eight weeks later in acute asthma. Now, I should say, this case and the few other cases I'm going to show are not exact um, extracts from the records, because we, we um, for, to preserve anonymity, I've uh, um, taken a couple of cases and combined them. But that message was a constant message. This is a child who sadly died from asthma. Six years old, asthma was diagnosed when he was three. And he was admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit with a life-threatening attack of asthma. Came back once to our patients to see the uh, consultant. And when he failed the next two appointments, we've got a ridiculous system in the UK that if somebody doesn't turn up for a hospital appointment, they discharge back to the GP. And the doctor's letter in this case said, I hope somebody will be looking after this child, but because of our trust policy, we're discharging uh, him back to, to the GP. So this kid saw the um, uh, GP, it was an upper respiratory tract infection. He had a red inflamed throat, his chest was clear on examination, he had a little bit of wheeze and lots of coughing on, on uh, the story. There's no record of any vital signs being recorded and no record of oxygen saturation. He's using two puffs of salbutamol four times a day. And, oh, I'm sorry, the doctor prescribed two puffs of salbutamol four times a day and amoxicillin for this consultation. And this child died 10 days later. Post-mortem confirmed that he had died from asthma. And at the time of death, he was not using any asthma medication, and his last prescription was three months before for formoterol, a long-acting beta agonist. He wasn't even prescribed an inhaled steroid recently. And over the last year, he'd had the odd prescription, but um, he clearly was uh, not uh, cared for as he should have. And you can see that in this case, this child fell between the hospital and the, the general practice, and nobody really took responsibility for his, uh, for his care. And in particular, his at-risk status, the, the near-death attack that he had should have flagged him up as a child at risk, in my opinion, forever of um, dying from asthma. And he should have been followed up by a pediatric respiratory specialist. And they discharge him back to the community. And that's not an uncommon finding in the UK. I don't know what happens here, but it's not uncommon in the UK. There's some nods in the audience. Um, so I'm going to start with the key messages that we found, because this is what I want you to take home. About half the people who died, died without calling for or without getting any help in their final attack. And this was what hit the headlines in the UK. And you ask yourself why, and it's not surprising, because three quarters of those people who died had never been issued with a self-management plan. There's no record in the notes of a self-management plan being issued. So it's no wonder that they didn't recognize the danger signs and call for help. There were major problems with prescribing, in particular excess reliever prescriptions and insufficient inhaled steroids, and I'll detail that for you. And then the other risks that were, were not identified by the health professionals were that 10% of these people had been discharged from hospital within a month of dying. Um, with an acute uh, severe attack. So they discharged from hospital, and a fifth had been seen in emergency departments at least once in the year before they died. And there's very little evidence that these people were followed up after those attacks. And our guidelines have said since 1990 that after somebody has had an attack, they should be followed up within 48 hours with the aim of uh, assessing control and optimizing the treatment and preventing the future attack. That's the one change that I think we could actually make which would reduce hospital admissions and, um, and deaths. And the other um, key message that I wanted to share was 58% of the people who died from asthma were managed as if they had mild or moderate asthma. Now, I'll talk about that in more detail. Our guidelines were not followed in half the cases. And my wife, who's not a GP, she's not a, a doctor, just made the observation that half the people who died were actually managed according to guidelines. So is there a problem with the guideline? Um, are there issues with 
the way that our guidelines are written or they're too complicated and that's something worth thinking about. So a little bit about death certificates because it's important to understand um, how death certificates and, and national mortality figures are actually derived to understand some of the data I'm presenting. Now, um, I pulled this off the internet and I, I, I think this, is this your death certificate? Is this what it looks like in Australia? Yes, no? Okay. Well, the international death certificate follows this pattern um, and you've got part one and part two. And most countries use part one and part two. Part one should be written so that you, you show the progression of the diseases leading to the death. So you've got parts 1A to D, and so in this case, we've got somebody who's had a chest infection, which leads to an asthma attack, which leads to cardiorespiratory arrest and death. So the death certificate should look like that, where you've got the progression of disease, um, which leads to the death. And you could add something else, and I'd encourage you to put smoking on your death certificates because it'll alert governments to the dangers of smoking. Because if somebody's a smoker and they die from respiratory failure, it's a, a condition that contributes to the death. Now, the national statistics are not based on death certificates. When you hear about the national death rates, they're based on the international classification of diseases, which is derived by the WHO, the World Health Organization. And so what national stat statistics organizations do is they take the death certificates, and they put them through an algorithm derived by the WHO, and they come out with an ICD code, an International Classification of Disease Code. And in asthma, that's J45 and 46. And that's the underlying cause of death. And that's what's used for national statistics. So if you've got a death certificate that reads like the one I just showed you, that'll be classified as an asthma death. However, if you've got a certificate which reads like that, where you've got chest infection in part 1A, and in part 2, the doctor's listed all the conditions this person ever suffered from, including asthma, that will also be classified as an asthma death, because asthma will trump the chest infection as a cause of death. Now, why is this important? If you look at asthma death studies, and I've just put a summary of some of the studies that have been published, including one from uh, Australia, um, you can see there's a column there called ICD coding. So that's the code that was applied to these people who died from asthma. Um, they were coded as underlying cause of death due to asthma. So if you look at the first row, you've got 129 people classified as asthma deaths according to the national statistics. But when they looked at the records and looked in depth at these cases, um, half of them had actually died from asthma. So the national statistics, and this is all over the world, um, on uh, death certification and uh, ICD classification um, are, um, are wrong. They overestimate the deaths by about, uh, well, up to 40%. Um, and the problem relates mainly to the way the death certificate is completed. And if the death certificate is completed as it was intended, then these statistics would be more accurate. But I mention that because it'll help you to understand the, uh, the data I'm going to show you. But we've got a law in the UK which uh, uh, gave us ethics permission to access identifiable information on people who died. Because those of you who've done research will know it can take a long time to get um, uh, ethics approval and it can take an even longer time to get people to agree to participate in research studies. And so with the study on death, we needed to access information immediately, um, and uh, this uh, ethics approval allowed us to do that. And so we were notified of all deaths where the word asthma appeared on the death certificate in the 12 months from February 2012 in the whole of the UK. Some of the notifications came from families and doctors and hospital colleagues. And so we got, we got some forms with details of the death certificates, where the person died, who looked after them. And we wrote to all the um, doctors looking after those people and asked for uh, information on those people. Now, um, three and a half thousand death certificates had the word asthma 
on, on it during that year. And you'll see from this slide, we excluded two-thirds of those cases because they were not classified as underlying cause of death due to asthma. So even though the word asthma was on the death certificate, two-thirds were not classified as asthma deaths. We did exclude 500 people who were over the age of 75 who were classified as asthma deaths, but where asthma was written in part two of the death certificate. And this was purely because of workload. We, we wouldn't have been able to cope with that workload. So we ended up with 900 cases, 900 people who died from asthma, whose information we sought uh, from the, the doctors. You'll see there were 38 children and young people amongst those, young, amongst those 900. Young people defined as people under the age of 19. And we wrote to all these doctors, so hospital doctors, general practitioners, and we asked for all information on prescriptions, correspondence, copies of uh, all consultations. And we also asked them to complete an audit sheet, hospitals and primary care, on the final attack and on previous asthma attacks. So I had the pleasure of looking through about 730 sets of medical notes to decide whether we would bring those cases back to discuss in detail in a confidential inquiry. And I did have some help with some retired respiratory physicians, because in particular, in the older people, it was quite difficult to uh, differentiate out the cause of death when people had multiple comorbidities. Now, you'll see that about a third of the cases, in about a third of the cases, we got no information from the clinicians or insufficient to consider these cases. Now, just to put that in context, our General Medical Council, our responsible body, states in its regulations that doctors must participate in confidential inquiries. And because this was the first national inquiry of its kind, um, these doctors were not reported to the authorities. But I think if this happens again, they, they may well be. And, you know, if you've got a child in your practice who dies from asthma, you would imagine that the doctor would want to share the information to try and um, learn from that. So we're quite shocked by those findings. We excluded 39% as not being asthma deaths. And this comes back to the point I made about the death certificates. We got letters from consultants and from GPs, and we got the records, which clearly indicated they hadn't died from asthma. So why somebody put asthma on the death certificate really beats me. And we ended up with 276 cases that we looked at in detail. And those cases came to confidential inquiry, which were one-day meetings, um, which were run by health professionals like you and me from primary, secondary, and tertiary care. And they looked at about an average of 10 cases at each um, uh, panel meeting. Two of the assessors had looked at two cases in depth um, so they both looked at the same two cases, so they had good knowledge of two cases. And the discussion during the day revolved amongst those um, uh, of the health professionals present, revolved around three questions, really. Did this person have asthma? Did they die from asthma? And what can we learn from these cases? Now, of the 276, 195, so only two-thirds, had actually died from asthma in the opinion of these doctors and nurses who looked at the records. They made 1,000 recommendations for change and they identified major preventable factors. Now this is 2012. Major preventable factors in 60% of those people who died. And the kind of things they identified were failure to recognize high risk status, lack of knowledge, um, lack of implementation of guidelines. And um, in the case of patients, um, there were a number of factors, including failure to take medication, failure to collect prescriptions, to attend for reviews. And so it wasn't just health professionals. Patients also had a role to play. Now, half these people died at home, and a third died in hospital, and a quarter died on the way to hospital. And Two striking things that we found. One was that the average age of diagnosis of these people who died, and most of the data I'm going to show you now relates to those 195 people who were confirmed asthma deaths. 
So the average age of diagnosis was 37. And we don't know whether this means that late onset asthma is, is a risk factor for asthma death. What we don't know is whether these people were true late onset asthmatics, so did they develop it in adulthood, or did they have it in childhood, which had gone quiet and then recurred again later, or had the diagnosis been missed entirely for years, which um, I'm sure all of you recognize happens. So we don't know the answer to that, and if any of you are doing research, it's a nice topic to look at. And the other thing we found was that 58% of these people were classified as mild or moderate asthma. 42% of the children and young people classified as mild or moderate asthma. Now, you'll know from your own guideline that classification of severity of asthma is defined as the amount of treatment needed to control asthma. So if somebody's on salbutamol and they're poorly controlled, it does not mean they've got mild asthma. And that's quite important because you'll see less than a fifth of these people who died had an assessment of asthma control. So we're not clear how the doctors decided these patients had mild asthma or moderate asthma. And it's possible that a lot of these people had much more severe asthma. And here's another case review which illustrates the point. So this is a man who's been diagnosed with mild asthma. His last review was two years before he died. And at that review, he was having symptoms on most days, using bronchodilator regularly, and his peak flow was less than 50% of that predict less than 50% of his best reading. And at that stage, the doctor prescribed beclomethasone, low dose inhaled steroid. Um, this guy failed to attend review appointments for asthma, like happens in many cases, but he did attend for other reasons, and nobody took the opportunity to assess his asthma and see um, what could be done. Um, he saw his doctor eight months before he died, complaining of wheeziness and coughing, and the doctor um, prescribed amoxicillin, an antibiotic for that event seen another few times in practice and died at home mowing his lawn. And this was confirmed as uh, due to acute asthma. And when you look back through his notes, he'd had 18 salbutamol prescriptions in the year before he died. And only one prescription for beclomethasone, that one that was prescribed when he had the review two years before he died. So did he really have mild asthma? I don't think so. Looking at some of the primary care data um, for these 195 cases, um, there was no record of a review in uh, about half of these cases. Um, I told you less than a fifth had an assessment of asthma control. Um, three quarters of these people had not been issued a self-management plan, and um, two thirds were not under specialist supervision. Now these were people who died from asthma, so you'd expect them to be under more, um, uh, to have more specialist involvement. When you look at the short-acting beta agonist prescriptions, because we had all the prescribing data, you can see that 40% of these patients were prescribed more than 12 salbutamol inhalers in the year before they died. One chap got 112 salbutamol inhalers. And you know, you wonder when doctors are writing prescriptions. Um, whether they're thinking about what they're writing. And uh, in Australia and in the UK as well, I believe you can buy salbutamol over the counter here. In the UK you can as well. And so the pharmacists don't have to tell us in the UK whether people are buying excess um, salbutamol. Now conversely, inhaled steroids, you'll be aware that some inhaled steroids come in inhalers with 200 doses and some come with 60 doses. So if you take the worst case scenario, Somebody who's prescribed an inhaler with 200 doses and they're using one puff twice a day, they would need at least four inhalers in a year. And 40%, 38% of these patients got less than four inhaled steroid inhalers and 80% got less than 12. So it's fair to say that most of these people were not prescribed sufficient uh, preventer medication. Now we made a number of recommendations in the NRAD and one of which because most of the GPs in the UK are computerized and most pharmacists are also computerized, we suggested that there should be an electronic tag 
which flags up on the records when excess bronchiolators are insufficient in how steroids were prescribed. Now that is a simple programming um, uh, 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 issue and that hasn't happened in the years since the publication of this report. Uh, I learned something from a colleague in uh, Los Angeles and so if you don't have a computerized system you can still identify people using excess bronchodilators and what they do in LA is they teach the GPs to treat salbutamol as if it was a controlled drug. So think carefully when prescribing it because this drug could kill your patient. If you don't prescribe a preventer together with a reliever and that patient's symptoms go unchecked, that patient's got a, a lethal prescription. And this has changed the way the doctors uh, treat asthma in LA. Um, I did mention that a lot of nurses are delegated to perform asthma reviews in the UK. And the doctors that we wrote to told us 42% of the practices were delegating asthma care to nurses without any training. And that, I think, is really unacceptable. Um, one of the problems relates to diagnosis of asthma. And 10% of these people who died, who, you know, of the 276, who were certified as dying from asthma, had no evidence whatsoever in their records that they had asthma. So they probably had something else, um, or undiagnosed asthma. Now we asked the panels to look at chronic management, uh, management of previous attacks, and management of the final attack, and assess the quality of care against our guidelines. And in a third of the cases, um, the management was adequate, only one third. And when you look at the children and young people, half of them were managed adequately in their final attack. So these are children and young people who got to hospital and only half of them were managed adequately. Um, and this is irrespective of where people were treated. So it's not a primary care problem. This related to hospital as well as primary care, which was a surprise to my consultant colleagues involved in this project. So overall, 16% of the 195 people were managed adequately, and only one out of the 28 children and young people were managed adequately. Um, we did summarize the data on um, management of uh, chronic management and management of previous attacks, but I'll just show you this slide just to illustrate that this wasn't a primary care problem. In the first two columns, you can see that 30% of those people who died um, who were treated in either primary or secondary care had at least one major preventable factor identified. And these related to delay or failure to initiate treatment for asthma. One child was in hospital for six hours before getting treated. Um, and in hospital, do any of you do casualty work? No, because some of the GPs in the UK and nurses do casualty work. Um, we found that um, the casualty doctors in three cases failed to identify abnormal carbon dioxide blood levels because when somebody is dying from asthma, they um, reduce their ability to get rid of carbon dioxide. So it gradually creeps up. And if it's within the normal range, but in the upper normal range, um, that's a life-threatening sign and it wasn't recognized by a number of the, uh, the doctors looking after these patients. There was a failure to follow people up after attacks, and that's after hospital admission and emergency department attendance, and these were missed opportunities. Now, just draw your attention to the, uh, the GINA guideline, which was published on World Asthma Day last year, the same day that our report was published, and asthma control assessment. Now, I know you've got similar details in your guidelines, but I wanted to just illustrate this because I think this is one of the most important lessons we've learned from the NRAD. Asthma control is assessed in two ways. How is the patient today, and what are the future risks of having attacks? So this one we're all familiar with. How are you today? Are you getting symptoms? Are you waking at night? Asthma interfering with your life? And are you using excess bronchodilator? Now, if somebody has three or four of those items, then they've got poorly controlled asthma, and they six times more likely to be admitted or to have an attack in the near future. But if somebody has none of those symptoms today, they might still be at risk. 
And I'd recommend you download this chart from Gina and stick it on your wall in your office because you've got the current asthma um, control assessment at the top, but more importantly, you've got future risk. So somebody who's not taking in health steroids or somebody's getting excess bronchodilator, somebody who's obese or has poor lung function, has a modifiable risk factor which can help prevent a future attack. Somebody who's been admitted to hospital has a non-modifiable risk factor. You can't change that. They've been admitted to hospital for acute asthma. They're at risk, and they should be treated as if they're at risk, even if they've got no symptoms today. Somebody who's been in intensive care is always at risk of dying from asthma, and they should really be followed up by specialists. Poor inhaler technique contributes, and it correlates very well with poor asthma control. So if someone can't use their inhaler, they can't get the drug in, it's not gonna work. Um, and your guidelines emphasize this. This is cut from your guidelines. So assess current control and future risk. It's really, really important. And do something. If the person's poorly controlled, do something about it. Not like that first case that I showed you where patients asked to come back. Now this is a Thompson's gazelle fawn. It's just been born. And its mother provides it with a self-management plan. It's a plan to keep alive. And that fawn is taught when it's not eating, it's got to hide. And if it doesn't hide, it doesn't survive. And with asthma, we know that if someone's got an asthma self-management plan, they're four times less likely to end up in hospital than somebody who hasn't. Um, chronic asthma with fixed airflow obstruction, we, we discovered something new in this study. Remember I said there were two things. One was the late... Uh, um, diagnosis, and the other was um, picked up by one of my consultant colleagues. We got letters from a lot of consultants saying, when we wrote for information, saying this person never had asthma, they had COPD. And when we looked through the records, these were people who had asthma all their lives. The GP had bought a spirometer, did spirometry, and classified the patient as COPD. So they stopped the asthma treatment and the person dies in acute asthma attack. And normally, it takes two years to get a new code for our computer systems in the UK. We got this new code through in four months. And if you look at the GINA guideline and the GOLD guideline, you'll see there's a chapter on the ACOS syndrome, it's asthma and COPD overlap syndrome. Now, I know there's a lot of debate about this, mainly among specialist circle, about uh, how, how um, accurate this description is. But what I, I'd like you to see is this chart, which I think is very useful for us in general practice. There's a list of asthma criteria on the left and COPD criteria on the right. And you just tick the boxes, and if your patient is more likely to have asthma, they'll have more asthma criteria, and conversely with COPD. And some people will have both. And the important thing is don't stop the asthma treatment. If someone's got a history of asthma all their lives, that's not going to go away, even if they've got fixed airflow obstruction. So continue the asthma treatment. So I've spoken about past asthma studies um, on asthma deaths, going back to the, uh, to the 1960s. And the sad thing is really that most of these findings, which have been found in previous studies, were um, repeated in the NRAD study. And I can't put it better than Einstein, really. We've really got to do something different. We can't go on like this. Now, we made 19 recommendations. I'm not going to read them all. I'd, I'd really recommend you have a look at the executive summary. Um, but one of the things we suggested was that anybody who's had two or more courses of oral steroids or two or more attacks of asthma um, should be referred to a specialist. And it doesn't have to be a hospital. It could be a specialist in primary care to have their asthma, um, optim asthma treatment optimized. Everyone should have an asthma action plan. And structured reviews um, should be done by health professionals with asthma training. I can't emphasize that strongly enough. It's not just a tick box exercise. You need to understand, first of all, that this person may not have asthma. Remember, 10% of those who died from asthma had no evidence that they had asthma. So you do need to have some knowledge. Um, Long-acting beta agonists should not be prescribed without an inhaled steroid and preferably prescribed in a combination. Now, I know you've got Alvesco on your...
guideline, um, which doesn't come as a combination, that's ciclesinide, so you would need to prescribe a uh, separate inhaler in those cases, but patients need to know that they do need to take both drugs. And patients need to understand that they should avoid risk factors, they should have a plan which tells them how and when to use the medication and when to call for help. And obviously they should avoid exposure to smoke. Now, I found this paper um, from Australia. I, I didn't find it, I actually refereed it before it was published in the BMJ. So I knew about it a long time ago. And this paper illustrates that you've got similar problems in Australia. This is published in 2013 in the BMJ. You've got delays in seeking help. You've got patients with psychosocial factors, patients who are uh, not prescribed sufficient preventer medication. And a high proportion of people in this Australian study um, died suddenly from asthma. And I'll just spend a few minutes on that. Does asthma die, I mean, does asthma death occur suddenly? And I think from most of the literature, it's not something that happens suddenly. The danger signs are usually there. And if they're looked for, they're obvious. In this case, the danger is obvious, but somebody might not recognize it. In this case, you've got danger which is hidden, and it's lurking under the water. And asthma is very much like this, where you can have a sudden attack which is unexpected, but in most cases, it is predictable. Um, so key actions were summarized in a paper I wrote recently in Breathe, which is available online. Um, it's a European Respiratory Society publication which summarizes the NRAD and some um, actions that we can take in primary care. Essentially, I think, well, not only prim primary and secondary care, I think we need to look at different systems for asthma care. Maybe bring specialists out into the community to help educate us in the community on management of asthma. Everyone should have a plan. And after an asthma attack, everyone should be assessed and the treatment should be optimized. It's no good carrying on with exactly the same treatment after someone's had an asthma attack. So we can't go on firefighting and just treating these attacks. We need to try and identify um, the problems. The GINA uh, guideline has a nice cycle of, of, of uh, assessment and optimizing asthma care. And um, if you're interested, I've put a, a, a review um, plan on my website for assessing uh, patients after they've had an attack. It's a one-page um, A4 document which helps you to identify um, what uh, risk factors this patient has and um, you then need to optimize the care. So is it really a mission impossible? I don't think so. This poor tortoise was trying to, the, the female was running while he was trying to mate and she's also chewing grass, but it was quite funny. So I'd like to acknowledge all the organizations that were involved and the key, um, the core team who helped to um, do the study. There were very few of us who did the work. Rachel Andrews, Rosie Houston, and uh, Laura Searle were the people who did most of the work for the study and I'd like to acknowledge their input as well as um, the governments of the four countries for commissioning the study and uh, helping us bring it to uh, fruition. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> we don't want any medical emergencies. Uh, our public relations company has just taken a call from uh, the Northern Territory News. Apparently Crocs cause asthma. Um, <laughs> uh, Mark, on behalf of Asthma Australia and, and all those present, thank you very much for flying 27 hours to be with us. It is no surprise that 12 months to the day since the report was launched yeah. that there has been considerable interest. And I look forward to future sessions where we do discuss uh, what are those key and emerging issues for asthma management over the next five years with a new national asthma strategy and whether many of, quite frankly, the sad lessons that you've presented today are transferable to our own country. But be on, on, on our behalf, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining with us uh, uh, today. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have some morning tea which is outside. I've been asked to remind people with dietary requirements that you have a special table.
and those of you that shouldn't, you shouldn't be eating the dietary requirements if you didn't re-register, but seriously, come and see me, I'll find you a carrot. Um, <laughs> and uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could put your hands together and thank uh, Dr. Levy on the behalf of Folks, if you could be back in this room at, uh, in about 30 minutes' time, so 11 o'clock, that would be wonderful. Thank you.